Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today on our first April session of Road to Research, Meet the Researcher. Today we are going to be meeting an undergraduate student researcher who's a current chemical and biomedical and engineering student. So the presentation today is going to be on therapeutic antibodies, so it should be really cool. And so now we'll just sort of um, touch on the agenda. Maddie, if you can please advance to the agenda slide. Thank you. As per usual, we will do our introductions then we will get to meet Maddie, our researcher today. We'll learn about her research, then we will break out into our breakout rooms and we'll come back for our conclusion at the end. Maddie, if you can advance the next slide, please. Thank you. So you should all probably know me by now. I'm Kristen Lavery. I'm the Assistant Director and Business Manager for the Leonard Gelfin Center for Service Learning and Outreach. And a couple fun facts about me. Uh, during college, I was able to study abroad in both France and Italy. And I consider myself to be a DIYer. Um, I recently built my first piece of furniture, which was a kitchen island, and I didn't have any specific plans for this. I just used internet resources. So it's really cool that you can learn how to do just about anything online today. I will go ahead and introduce our next member of our coordination team. It's Dr. Vicki Webster-Wood. She's an assistant professor in mechanical engineering. Vicki, would you like to say a few things about yourself? Thanks, Kristen. Hi, everybody. Um, many of you will also already know me by now, uh, but I run the biohybrid and organic robotics group uh, in our mechanical engineering department at CMU. Um, in addition to playing with robots, I have a number of other hobbies uh, I've developed along the years. Um, I like to quilt and crochet, uh, and I also just started a strawberry garden, so I'm hoping for some fresh strawberries this year. Uh, more in the engineering world, uh, I also know five programming languages, uh, and I actually learned four of them in high school. So if robotics and programming is something you're interested in, that's something to look at uh, as you get into high school. Uh, and if we can head to the next slide. I'll go ahead and introduce um, Allison Rojas, who is one of our undergraduate members of our coordination team. Uh, Allison, do you want to say a few words? Yeah, thank you, Vicki, uh, Professor Webster Wood. Um, so, um, just a few fun facts about me. I'm sure that you that I've met a lot of you before too. Is that um, I love meal prepping with local market food. Um, I live in the Strip District, and it's it's really nice. They have a lot of markets here, um, and I enjoy jogging and playing soccer in my free time. And then also, um, recent um, well, previously I've worked on STEM identity research which sort of helps foster STEM identity within like the STEM community. So, so that's just more on the STEM side too. Um, and if we could go on to the next slide, please. And we would love to have a chance for each of our mentors to also introduce themselves. So I'll call on them now to uh, briefly say a fun fact and, and, uh, and about them a little bit. So um, let's start out with Emma. Hi. Hi everyone, sorry, I think my camera doesn't seem to want to turn on, but um, I'm Emma, I'm a, there we go, I'm a, a third year PhD student in the mechanical engineering department. Um, I, my research is in building DNA microsomers. Um, I presented at the fall if you were there. Um, and uh, fun fact about me, I'm currently trying to learn to play the drums. Right now, uh, anything harder than a quarter note is really complicated, so I appreciate tips if anyone's an expert. Oh, that's really exciting. Emma, thank you for sharing. Um, next up, Terry. Hey everyone, I'm Terry. I'm a PhD student in the Robotics Institute and I do research on whisking robots, which I also talked about in the fall. Uh, fun fact about me, I recently got a hammock, so I've been enjoying hiking all over Pittsburgh and putting it up in, like, in beautiful places. So that's been lots of fun. Well, that sounds really lovely. Um, and then last but not least, Sharfin, can you please introduce yourself? 
Yeah, so I'm Sharfin. I'm a senior in my key at CMU, and I do research in the robot mechanics lab. Uh, and my fun fact is I have three older sisters. So imagine growing up with four moms, basically. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we're very excited to mentor you today. Thanks, Allison. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and um, meet our presenter today, Madison Greer. She goes by Maddie. So Maddie, thank you very much for joining us today. And we're gonna be starting off with a poll. And this one is all about where Maddie is from. So Maddie is from the Philadelphia area. And the city's name is made from the Greek words philio and adelphos, which mean, and I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll right now. See a poll pop up on your screen. And Philadelphia is derived from the Greek words for philio and adelphos, which mean A, love and brother, B, Phil and love, C, brother and city, D, young and sister, and E, sister and city. Okay. We're a little divided on our responses today. All right. I'm gonna go ahead and end polling and share our results. And it looks like our winner was B, Phil in Love. Maddie, would you like to advance the next slide there? And share our answer. So the answer is actually A, Phileo means love and Adelphos means brother. So it's a city of brotherly love. Okay, so I guess <laughs> I'll talk a little it. bit more about like me. So I am from the Philadelphia area and then here's me in a couple different of uh, my favorite places. So this lake is called Lake Lena. It's by my house and I would go there all the time, go on nature walks. Um, this is the Rocky statue that is outside the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Actually, this is a more recent photo because they used to have the Rocky statue on the steps in the movie. Rocky runs up the steps and then jumps up at the top in this kind of pose. And they also have a plaque of where his feet are. Um, so there's a lot of fun memories tied to this place. And then over here, um, I would also go to the Jersey Shore a lot since it's really close by. Um, so here's a picture of me and my sister and me down at the Jersey Shore. My sister's name is Erin. My little brother's name is Brandon. So, yeah. Hey, what was your favorite thing to do when you were younger? My favorite thing to do when I was younger, I really liked drawing, which is why I like going to the museum a lot and looking at all the different kind of art. And then my second favorite hobby was going on nature walks and I would actually collect a lot of specimens. I'd put them all into a plastic bag and actually like label them specimens with a date, which is kind of funny for like a little So thing you would catalog do. everything on your nature walks. Yeah. <laughs> Did you ever incorporate what you found into pieces of artwork? Sometimes when I was little, I was also really into like making nests, like out of the sticks and stuff that I would find. And so that's kind of like a form of art, I guess. Neat. Yeah. Um, and so, so I it. got a little bit more serious into art at around middle school, I actually started developing a portfolio where I would include like a lot of natural elements like this picture has butterflies and this one has trees. And then also here's me at a different museum. I was really interested in things like rocks. So here I am pretending to steal a giant crystal. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were in eighth grade, which, you know, maybe that's when that picture was taken, where did you picture yourself being? 
So I actually pictured myself being like a magazine editor or an artist, which is pretty different than where I am now today. Um, I think people usually look at like creativity and science in two different camps, whereas they're more related. And having like a creative mind actually makes research really fun and more enjoyable and, and also more interesting because it gets you thinking about problems differently. Um, so, yeah. Nice. And did you ever participate in any uh, camps or programs for these artistic interests? Mm -hmm. I was part of uh, museum societies, my local museums um, were the Mitchner Museum and a History Museum. And so I got to teach a lot of um, younger kids about how to make different kinds of crafts at the History Museum. And I taught like comic book classes and that kind of stuff um, when I was working with the art museum. And then also in this next slide, um, as going into high school, some clubs that I was involved in were 4-H, which is uh, like a farming and agricultural club, Society of Women Engineers. And here I am at a uh, camp called Pennsylvania Governor's School for the Sciences. And, and, and can you tell us a little bit, that, that's really awesome, like all this. Um, and, and can you tell us a little bit more about like how were your experiences in, in these different clubs? Like um, what did you enjoy about them? I think where I really got interested more towards science and art was in PGSS. The camp was structured as I would take a bunch of um, scientific college classes. I remember there was immunology and special relativity and it was a lot of new topics that I'd never heard about before and that really got me more interested in specifically genetics and antibiotics and medicine which I'm interested in now. Yeah no that's awesome and 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 what did it also teach you about like different leadership positions and sort of guide you into like future decisions that you made it sounds like right? Mm -hmm. So for science, uh, Society of Women Engineers and also Science Olympiad, which is another science club that I was involved in in high school, in my leader pos leadership positions, I really um, realized how important it is to work in groups. Um, and also another lesson I learned was that you should never be afraid to ask questions for help because that's really how you learn. Um, and yeah, so those leadership positions in those two clubs taught me that. Yeah, that's incredibly important. Yeah, that's, yeah. Um, and then just, I was, also, I was also curious if there was any specific subjects or projects that were a little bit difficult to, for you as you were like being exposed to all this new content and how that sort of like helped also bridge your future decisions. So when I was in high school, I would say the toughest subject for me was math. Um, I thought that I wasn't great at math and that kind of discouraged me from going into science because there's a lot of math in science. But with everything, if you work at it more and more, you can get better. And so basically what I want to say is like, even if you don't think you're the best at something that's related to a field that you are interested in, don't let it discourage you because it can lead to a really fulfilling experience if you just you know, practice and get better and everyone's learning. So it's, yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it just takes time and patience and practice. Yeah, thank you for sharing. I think it's really important. And then we can head on to the next slide if that's good. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit more about your majors um, and what your favorite CMU perk is? Um, so my favorite CMU perk is we get free access to Phipps Conservatory, which is the Botanical Garden place. And I love that place so much. This is from one of my more recent trips. Um, the theme was poetry and nature. So I took these two photos while I was there. And as far as my major, um, I'm in chemical engineering and biomedical engineering. And biomedical engineering, my uh, concentration of interest is cellular and molecular biotechnology. So I, I work on like really small technological aspects of biology and then chemical engineering. Um, I originally made that my major because I was really interested in 
chemistry, but chemical engineering is actually probably more um, engineering of different kinds of like factory processes and industrial processes than it is um, chemistry. But that's also really interesting because we learn about things like heat transferring from one thing to another and fluid flow and things like that. Wow. Wow. That sounds really involved and, and amazing. And I also love FIPS, by the way. It, it's great. And I'll transfer it over to Krista now to continue with some of the slides. Same. I'm also a big fan of FIPS and walking through there, especially with the camera. <laughs> um, so now we're going to hear a little bit more about your research, Maddie. And to do that, we're going to kick things off with another poll. We are going to ask all of you, what is true about your immune system? I'm going to go ahead and launch our poll now. This one is a multiple choice question. So what is true about your immune system? Is it A, it protects your body from germs. B, your innate immune system involves general protections like skin and mucus barriers. C, your adaptive immune system involves cells designed to kill specific threats. D, antibodies are what connects your immune system cells to specific threats. Or E, all of the above. Okay, looks like we have almost all of our responses here. I'm gonna go ahead and end our polling now and share our results. Looks like our winner then is E, all of the all of the above. Maddie, can you tell us what our correct answer is? So the correct answer was E, all of the above. All of these facts are true. It's true that your body does protect or your immune system does protect your body from germs. Um, and then B and C are also correct. I'll talk a little bit more about your innate and adaptive immune system in the next slide. Um, and as well as antibodies in the following slide, antibodies are designed by your immune systems to specifically target one kind of threat so it can be stopped and the body can remember it. So um, it can fight against that threat in the future. Okay. So I'm gonna transfer it over to Allison here and she's gonna be talking to you all more about immunity. Um, I can just briefly explain these two branches first. So the two branches like we learned about in the poll are your innate immune system and your adaptive immune system. Um, so basically your innate immune system is kind of like your first line of defense uh, of your body's protection against invaders. And so it can inform and activate a more rigorous immune response. It can destroy bacteria and germs right away, or it can also repair things like cuts and um, wounds. Um, there's three general branches, physical barriers, chemical barriers, and cellular defenses. So I'll give a few examples of what each of those are. So for physical barriers, that can be your skin. Your skin protects you from germs as well as like different skin functions like peeling and drying that can also work to protect you. Um, then like secretions like tears and mucus. So your mucus traps um, different kinds of debris and germs that you breathe in so it can't get past your nose, for example. And then also you have things um, called cilia also in your nose, which are kind of like finger-like projections that stick outside of the cells in your nose and it kind of pushes the mucus down. So once it gets trapped up there, it's flushed back out. Um, and then different chemical barriers can be like the acidity of your stomach and skin. So um, a lot of bacteria is immediately killed if there's bacteria or germs or something on your food and you swallow it. Your, the pH of your stomach, which is really acidic, generally kills a lot of those. Um, and then also things like your tears and mucus can have microbicidal factors in them, which is kind of just like your body's natural hand sanitizer. And then cellular, cellular defenses can be things like um, non-specific white blood cells, which are just 
regular immune cells, like there's a kind of cell called a phagocyte, which its whole job is when it sees something that doesn't look like it really belongs in the body, it just eats it. Like it engulfs it and then it dissolves it to get rid of it. Um, and now I'll talk a little bit more about the adaptive immune side of things. Um, there's two general different kinds of immunity. There's active immunity and passive immunity. So active immunity, there's natural and vaccination. When you get sick, you develop natural active immunity. So if you have a cold, your body recognizes the cold, fights against the cold, and then you're usually immune to that cold for a while. But we can also vaccinate people, which is instead of getting the cold virus, you're getting parts of the cold virus to trigger an immune response so that, you're, um, so that your body can get past that and protect itself against that threat in the future. Um, so those are two different kinds of active immunity. And then we have passive immunity, which is just you receive antibodies that can fight against the threat but it doesn't really cause like a full blown immune response. So you won't be immune in the future. So a mom, if she's carrying a child, she can pass some antibodies along to that child and that child can be immune in that way. Uh, there's also artificial immunity, which people can be injected or receive antibodies. Um, and as long as you're receiving those injections, you'll be immune, but it's again, passive. So um, your body can't actually make those um, antibodies to be, um, to protect against that threat in the future. So those are the two general branches. Thank you for sharing that. And it looks like we have a question in the chat about how do phagocytes eat cells? It's really, they like, they just engulf it. The cell morphs and takes it in. It's kind of like, think of like maybe like a cell, like a water balloon and it'll just morph around it. And then as soon as it engulfs it, it just dissolves it with like different kinds of enzymes and inside of it. So it's like a structural and chemical process bundled mm -hmm. up into one. Oh, okay, that's awesome. Uh, and then I, you mentioned that antibodies are involved within both active and passive immunity. Is there like a difference within like both of those in terms of the antibodies? Um, so there you have a lot of different kinds of antibodies. Um, I guess the, the bigger difference is like, like vaccine versus natural and um, maternal versus artificial. It's more like, is it engineered um, or not? Could be a big difference. Um, but as long as it completes the function, there'll be like a little bit of differences between every person. Um, they're not like only this super specific kind of antibody can kill it. It's just like, does it fit? Does it not fit? Um, there'll always be small differences. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I think you've touched on this too, but like how antibodies and immune cells are made, I'm sure that differs also along these two branches that you've mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I, I can talk a little bit more about how the um, immune cells that produce the antibodies are made in the next slide. Perfect. So here is a general overview of how they're made. All the B cells and T cells, which are the specific immune cells involved in the re immune response involving antibodies, those cells are made in red bone marrow. So for, if you can see the first step right here. Um, so T cells and B cells are initially made in the bone marrow and they start out as these things called lymphocytes, which are undif undifferentiated cells. And that just means that they're immune cells that are too young to have a specific job yet. As they grow and mature, they can change a little bit and then they can perform jobs, but that happens later. Like once these lymphocytes are transported to the thymus gland, all of the immune cells that are packaged and matured here will turn into T cells. If they mature and are packaged actually in the bone marrow, they'll turn to B cells. Um, and then through the blood, after like the T cells are packaged in the thymus gland and the B cells are packaged in the bone marrow, they'll all go 
to a secondary organ, like a lymphatic organ, which like a spleen, which your lymphatic system is just processing of fluids in your body. And then from these kinds of organs that process fluids, the B cells and T cells are sent out across your body um, when an immune response is triggered. Thank you for going into that detail. I think that helps with the visualization of it. And, and it looks like we also did have a, another follow-up uh, clarification on the, I think on the passive immunity, um, the mm -hmm. question states the artificial passive immunity is like the covalescent serum we have heard about in COVID-19, right? Um, I think so. I haven't, I haven't done much research into that, but if it's, the COVID vaccine is like active immunity vaccination, but um, yeah, I believe that that would be considered if you're receiving the antibody that that would be artificial immunity. Got it. That makes sense. Thank you. And we can move on to the next slide, I think. Um, okay, so now that we know how B cells and T cells are made, I'm going to talk a little bit more about how they get the bad guy cells or the germs. So the first step is the B cell finds an antigen, which is just, it's this red piece right here. It's kind of like a little name tag that the germs will have on them. So the B cell finds an antigen which matches its receptors. These receptors that this B cell has, a couple different kinds, those are antibodies. And so when the antibody on the B cell matches this antigen on the bad guy cell, it links like this. He's saying this one fits. And then we go to step two. Um, it waits connected to this germ cell until it's activated by a T helper cell. So this guy comes along um, and he tells this guy, okay, now you, we can go to step three, which is the B cell dividing to produce plasma and memory cells. So these are two different kinds of B cells. The plasma cell says, okay, since this antibody fits this bad guy cell, I need to make a lot of those so I can flag, so I can flag them for the immune system to attack. And then here's like a white blood cell. Once he's flagged with these antibodies made from the plasma cell, then this immune cell, he basically just eats everything that's tagged. And then these memory cells, the other kinds of cells that are made, um, if the intruder invades again, he remembers that he has an antibody that fits this and we can trigger an immune response oops, much faster. That makes sense too. And, and just to sort of follow up on, on clarification of something. So the, the sort of Y shaped uh, extrusions from the, from the B cell, those are the antibodies, correct? Got it. And then those are acting as receptors in this case. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And, and um, a, a follow-up question also is, um, how do these cells know what kind of antibody to make? So when germs enter your body with antigens on them, your body can't design an antibody to match it. What happens is your body has a ton of different kinds of antibodies. It's always making different kinds of antibodies. And then these cells with antibodies are floating through your bloodstream. And as soon as they just come into contact, um, then the immune system is triggered. So instead of your body designing antibodies for a threat, it's what do we have that can attack this? Got it. Got it. That also makes sense. And on average, how long would you say that the memory cells live um, after they've been initially created? So memory cells usually live for a couple of years. Memory cells are what determines how long you have immunity to a specific kind of threat. So if it was a real big immune response, usually those memory cells are going to last years and years and years and years. Um, but if it was just a small response, they might last for like one, maybe two years, sometimes even a couple months. But it's much longer. They live much longer than the plasma cells. That definitely helps. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense too. 
I'm going to hand it over to Kristen to also start over, start up a poll. Thanks. Thanks, Allison. All right. Before we advance that next slide, um, Maddie, if you can go back. Oh, yeah, sorry. Just one. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. And I had I had noticed um, <laughs> the, the, the green eater cell. I like that that is the illustration of the phagocyte, the, the cell that then chomps yeah. on everything. <laughs> I'm a fan. It's pretty of scary looking. <laughs> yeah, these are the warriors of your body. Okay. So moving on, we have another poll, but this one is actually going to be one that we'd like you to answer in the chat. So what are some examples of invaders that the body must protect itself from. So we'll give you a little while to think about this and then answer in our chat. So we have some responses starting to come in now. Viruses. It's one of our responses, fungi. Mm -hmm. Can anyone else think of any threats or invaders that our, our body must protect itself from? Diseases? Right, so these are all a couple of different examples. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so these are pretty good examples. Diseases can kind of be like an umbrella term for like bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Um, and then like different kinds of bacteria. Like if, you, if you've ever gotten strep throat, that's a bacteria. If you've ever gotten a cold, that's a virus. So yeah, these are all good answers. Nice. Thanks, everyone. So moving on, let's hear more about antibodies. So here um, is a structure of an antibody. We have these in red are called light, change, light chains. These in blue are heavy chains. They generally form this Y shape. Um, although there can be different shapes, this is um, this is the one that we're gonna focus on today. Um, and then, so we have this area called the constant region, which means like all these Y-shaped antibodies generally have this same structure up until right here, the variable, re the variable region. And you can see this kind of has a weird shape. This will change depending on um, what, what kind of antibody, I mean, what kind of antigen um, this antibody can um, target, so. Mm -hmm. um, and Maddie, why are they called chains? They're called chains because antibodies are made out of proteins and the structure of proteins is it's a bunch of small units called amino acids and they're all linked together in a chain to build the protein. So that's why they're called chains. Oh, interesting. So that I think is going to take us into our next poll. It's also going, <laughs> there is a, uh, a comment <laughs> in the chat that I hadn't noticed before that our, our body thinks that pollen is a foreign invader too, <laughs> especially during allergy season, <laughs> which is yeah. right now. <laughs> um, so our poll question is, do you think it is possible to create specific antibodies for diseases artificially? I'll give you a couple seconds to think about that and then answer uh, in our chat. Seems like a resounding yes so far. 
So the answer is actually no. This is like to my previous point, I just wanted to drive home that our bodies can't look at a germ and make an antibody that attacks it. We just have a bunch of antibodies ready to go and, and then we see if they match the germ that's entered the body. But um, people can engineer antibodies to attack things artificially um, outside, outside of your body. Um, so in that way, it is possible, um, but your body can't do it. Um, and that takes me into therapeutics. So this is how engineers can utilize antibodies to actually attack things that normally um, we can't make antibodies for. So therapeutics are medicine. Like I said, they use antibodies. Um, if you have something like cancer or something that your body usually doesn't make antibodies to attack, we can actually design in the lab antibodies to attack it. And how we do this is we have a bunch of different kinds of cells that are always producing antibodies. And then we sample the cell media. The cell media is just what the cells are grown in. So it's just like their environment that they take in nutrients. We sample the media to see what kinds of antibodies these cells are producing. When we find the right antibody, we take those cells that are producing the right antibody, we isolate them and we make a bunch of them. And that's how we develop this thing called a cell line um, to, to create the antibodies used in therapeutics. Awesome. So, so uh, can you explain a little bit more about what cell lines are and how they're important in science? So, it, so a cell line is like, it's just one specific kind of cell with one engineering job. So if we, if we want an antibody that specifically targets this one kind of cancer, there's one cell line that produces all of the antibodies that will be used for that specific purpose. Um, and they're really similar cells that only produce one kind of thing. Okay. And so it, it sounds kind of like then that if you need that specific kind of artificially created antibody that you can get a cell that you engineer to be able to produce that. And then that's almost a little factory for that antibody. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Exactly. Like each cell can be considered a factory to create that one kind of antibody or for that one kind of function. And then actually what we do is once we have those cells, we can put them all into a bioreactor. And then that's even like a bigger factory because it's like this big container growing up all these cells, which are little factories in and of themselves. Can you explain a little bit more about what a bioreactor is? That sounds cool. It's kind of like this big tank that has our specific kind of cell media with all the cells from that cell line in it. Um, and we can monitor it. We'll sample the media to take out the antibodies we need. We'll put more media in so the cells can continue to grow and produce things. Um, and my research is actually in what kinds of things can we add to the media in bioreactors to improve the quality of the kinds of antibodies that we're getting out of them. Okay. And so what's you know, before we get to, to your research and the things you add, what's in that kind of basic media? Um, so cells really like sugary food and nutrients. So it's mostly just water, the right pH, um, and then like food, like sugar and things like that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And do you have to um, keep these cells in any special conditions? So cells usually like pretty warm conditions, not not hot, not cold. It's very like um, Goldilocks, not too hot, not too cold, not too acidic, not too basic, um, very medium kinds of conditions. There's like oxygen levels that have to be maintained and um, as well as like humidity levels. Um, so all these factors go into what kind of conditions the cells like. And it, it looks like um, we've got some questions coming in in chats. Um, so would you keep the cells at, at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? It depends. Um, 
they're all about that temperature like but there's there's a range depending on what kind of cell like um for for therapeutics the cells that we actually use are chinese hamster cells which might involve a slightly different environment than like human cells but also um you know, if we wanted a different product, we could even use like an insect cell or a bacterial cell. Um, and then since these are all different kinds of organisms, they all have different temperatures that are more applicable for what kind of cell it is. Very cool. Um, and I'm not sure what this question is about. Have you seen Elon Musk's tweet? I don't know if he tweeted about antibodies, um, but I'm not no, sure what, what that's about. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> oh, I'm about seen. bacteria. I have not seen, I, I'm really bad at Twitter. <laughs> I've not seen it, I don't think. Okay. Uh, we'll have to go go look at that after, after the session. Um, awesome. Well, can you tell me a little bit more about how your work has related to these antibodies and, and the media uh, that they're in? Mm -hmm. I think I'll go to my next slide for this. So even though we have one cell that produces one kind of antibody, all these antibodies, so like if one cell produces 100 antibodies, each of these antibodies can have different sugars attached to them. And this at like a basic level is what these sugars can look like. They're like attached right here, like right where the three parts of the Y intersect. Um, and then they're made up of all these small units. These are all different kinds of sugars um, linked and then they're attached to the antibody. So my research is what can we add to the cell media to give them the right materials so we get like a higher concentration of what we want like what we want might be this kind of um sugar with like no fucose attached to it for example and we can improve like how many antibodies we're seeing with this specific sugar attached by changing what we add to the cell media it's kind of like if you have an assignment to do for school, everyone's project is gonna look different depending on what kinds of materials that they have. Like if I only have red markers, my final product is gonna look different than somebody who only has like blue markers or something like that. So we're basically giving them the, the cells the right tools so they can, it'll push like what they produce to look more um, cohesive, similar, homogenous to look like this. So this sugar, you're, you're saying that's connected right at where that Y branches? Is, is that mm -hmm. connected at those um, disulfide bonds that we saw on the earlier slide? Right. So this this chain of things, like these these are all the amino acids I was talking about earlier. This chain of amino acids where this sugar is attached is right at these disulfide bonds um, on the antibody. And how does sugar attaching to the antibody change its function or therapeutics? So for example, we've noticed that when the sugars have a fucose attached, like all of these have a fucose attached, um, that's why they're called G0F, F meaning fucosylation, meaning this red thing's attached. We've noticed that when this red fucose sugar is attached, that it's actually harder for the cells to bind to immune cells down here, it like kind of inhibits the immune cell binding, which is important because if your immune cells aren't binding to these antibodies, which flag the bad things that are happening, then your immune response is gonna be much slower because the immune cells are, are what's carrying out this response. And if they can't really bind, then it'll be a less effective medicine. Wow. Um, so are there always sugars that end up attaching at this mm -hmm. spot? Okay. And Generally, so every antibody is going to have like some combination of these sugars. There's other kinds of sugars um, besides these, but these are the main ones that we see. Okay. So it's really important to get the right type of sugar for your immune system to be effective. Mm -hmm. And right. it's also important for the antibodies that you're producing to all look like that one that we want. Right. So they're consistent, like from a factory. Yeah. Quality control. Yeah, exactly. That's really cool. 
So this slide, I'm going to talk a little bit more about like what I specifically did. So what I specifically did for this particular experiment is I added this thing called glutamine, which again, like, like most things that are added to cell media, it's just a variation of like a sugary water, basically. Um, but it's like really good sugar. Like it's like um, an apple or something that makes the cells really happy. Um, and we can see, so relative abundance is basically how much of that are we seeing. So we're seeing a lot of antibodies with the G0F sugar attached. And then the basic setup of my experiment is we see how the levels of the antibodies with these sugars attached changes over time. So for example, the G0F, we're seeing more and more of the antibodies with this sugar attached over time after adding glutamine on day zero. Um, and you can note that we're seeing more G0F. G0F looks like this, and you can see that there's a red fucose attached to it, and that's not necessarily good. So we know that we should probably be adding something else. Very cool. So for these experiments, you, you talked about how you're growing these cells and you have these different bioreactors. So do you basically have uh, a different set of cells for each of these columns or is this all one set of cells that you're measuring each of these uh, seven sugars in? Um, so for this particular experiment. Uh, this is actually one stage before bioreactors. So we're just having cells in like just a container, like a flask with media in it, and they're constantly being stirred, which is like the, like a basic bioreactor, but a bioreactor is like a ton, a ton of cells. So these are like smaller experiments just in a flask. And there'll be like hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of cells in this one tiny flask. And then all of those cells are producing a ton of antibodies, like um, thousands of them. Um, and then all of the antibodies that each cell is producing, they're the same antibody, but they're slightly different. They all have different sugars attached. So one cell doesn't create one antibody with one kind of sugar. It's like one cell, one antibody, can have a varying range of different sugars that it makes. How do you measure which types of sugars are attached? So this, this is a little bit complicated. So we, so once the cells finish making the antibodies, they release them into the cell media and then we sample the cell media. So we just, we just like take some of that away from the little flask. And then we kill all the cells that are in it and then we further purify it. So we take everything out that's not the antibodies. Um, and then we pass it through this thing called a UPLC, which is liquid chromatography. Basically what that is, it's a, it's a machine. You pass the fluid through and we get all these different signals. And so all the different signals represent one antibody with one kind of sugar attached to it. And if that signal is like super high, then we know we have like a lot of G0F, for example. Um, so it's, yeah, that's how that works. Very cool. So there's a lot of really specialized equipment that you've gotten to learn how to use and work with as an undergrad even uh, yeah, doing this project. Uh, wow, that's really exciting. So the big takeaway here was you learned we definitely don't want to give them that glutamate. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because then, yeah, exactly. They'll be less likely to attach to the immune cells. Um, but also another result, because we don't just monitor like what sugars are attached. We also monitor things like antibody concentration, which is like, if we add glutamine, are we seeing that they produce more antibodies? And that's, that's true, um, which is kind of predicted because we're kind of giving them like a sugary, healthy snack. So they're making a lot more antibodies. It's just not necessarily what we want. And we're also monitoring things like um, percent productivity, um, which is, it's basically how efficient are the cells at making antibodies. And so what are the two lines we're seeing here, the, the titer and the QP? 
So titer, the red line is antibody concentration, and that's just how many antibodies are there. And the QP is productivity. So that's how well are the cells making the antibodies? Like, um, is it 100 cells producing 10 antibodies or is it 10 cells producing 10 antibodies? Um, like what, how efficient are they at making them? So that's like a, like a complicated formula. Okay, cool. And it looks like we've got a, a question in the chat. Um, you mentioned chromatography. Is that the same kind of chromatography that works with, say, using a, a marker on a piece of paper towel and then dipping it in the water to see the color that spreads? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like if you have a wet paper towel and you put like a black marker line on it, it'll like expand out and you'll see a lot of different colors. And that's because each of the colors go through the paper towel at different speeds. And it's kind of the same, um, it's kind of the same, well, it is the same like general idea, but in this case, the media that we have that's purified, so it's just antibodies is actually passing through a column. And each of the different antibodies with specific sugars travel through at different rates, kind of like how the different colors travel through the paper towel at different rates. And so when they exit the column, it'll be like a lot of the fastest one, and then the second fastest one, and then the third fastest one. And that's why we can see really distinct peaks. Um, and then the signals will be like, okay, well, we, we see a lot of red, or we see a lot of like G0F. Um, so that's how that works. Very cool. And, and that's, you know, with these different structures, I would imagine that these different sugars have different weights because some of them have extra material added. Does that affect the speed of how they travel through that column? Yeah, exactly. That's like exactly how it works. So like um, the columns designed so like heavier sugars come out later and lighter sugars come out earlier, but also what's involved are like chemical properties, like are the sugars charged, like what are, what are the different properties of the um, sugar, so they'll stick at a very specific speed as they're traveling through the column based on weight, but also other things like are they charged or like how do they interact otherwise like is it like a really spread out kind of looking molecule or is it, you know, really dense? Um, so like a bunch of different factors go into how fast it travels through the column, although weight is an important one. Yeah, so I imagine that if, if they're charged and that's changing their speed, that's almost like how if you like charge a balloon, it like lifts your hair, right? It provides that force uh, mm -hmm. to pull it through. Okay. It's a cool piece of equipment. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And it's like huge. It's like really funny because you put like such a small amount in and then it travels through like a million, a million different loops. And it's this whole, yeah, it's pretty cool. I mean, a, a big uh, actual piece of equipment for such tiny little things to be measured. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think I feel like we see that all the time in this biology related work, right? Um, mm -hmm. I've got this giant centrifuge in my lab for getting like this much material. Yeah. Um, awesome. So when you're when you're measuring the antibody concentration, how do you measure that weight? Because they're so tiny. Um, well, like this is not my area of expertise, but like, um, so it has to do, if you've seen like the periodic table of elements, each like unit element, unit chemical has different weights. And then those atoms make up amino acids, which are like the base molecule in the chain that is the protein that's the antibody. So they actually have to figure out what the structure of the antibody is and then calculate adding up all the weights of the different elements, how heavy is that gonna be? And then, and also like the sugars will have their own weights which are like determined by other people running like standards. Um, and then, yeah. And then, so when we get the signals, we can see like, okay, this one's at this weight and we know that this antibody with this sugar is this specific weight. Um, 
Okay, so it's a combination of knowing how much is there, but then also knowing which building blocks are part of it and calculating what all those building blocks would weigh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. exactly. Very cool. Awesome. So I think you've also done some modeling work. Yes. So this is the next slide. The very last stage of this project that I worked on is once we know what kinds of things we are adding to the media to change it different ways, um, we can grow up the cells in a big bioreactor like I talked about before. So we're running the bioreactor with really specific chemicals added, really specific um, environmental conditions. Um, and so the modeling is, we have a mathematical, like basically an equation that predicts um, what's gonna happen in the bioreactor. Like we have uh, glucose concentration, lactose concentration, cell densities, titer, all these different things that the bioreactor is um, monitoring. And then this equation predicts what are all of these going to be at these different time points? And so this this is ours. So this will be, oh, this, that was supposed to say 350, but it's like zero to 350 hours. This is like a 14 day run um, monitoring the levels of these things in the bioreactor at each time. So this, this um, solid line, this is what the equation is saying and then these like little bursts that's what we're actually seeing so we can kind of see that our model is not great like if we look like the original model if we look at this equation like this green thing that's being monitored this is what we predict it to look like and what it's actually looking like are these green bursts mm -hmm. and that's pretty different so what we do is knowing that we can use like a big giant calculator called MATLAB and we can add different things to the equation to make it look closer to the data, which we see over here. So after I added things to make the model more, the mathematical model more specific, we can see that it's looking a little bit more like the data. And this is important because once we get a mathematical data that considers a lot of different, once we get a mathematical model that considers a lot of data and looks like what we're seeing in real life, then we can use that to predict how it'll behave if we add different things. So rather than testing like a lot of different conditions and seeing how it works, we can predict that with a mathematical model. Awesome. So you start from some equations about how you think it works, right? And then you've you've basically programmed that equation in, in MATLAB, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So that's another one of those programming languages that, you know, I, I'm always encouraging programming. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> and then you're comparing it with those experiments, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so what what were the kind of changes that you had to make in order to get the model to look more like those experimental starbursts? So um, MATLAB has a function that fits like a model to the data by minimizing the, the difference between the each point along this graph. And so it's it's like a little tool that we can use. Um, it just changes like, like if you add four or something to, to an equation, it'll move the whole graph up. So it makes a lot of these small changes to minimize the distance. And then it tells you what that equation would be. And what kind of uh, courses or background experience did you need to be able to do this kind of work? So for the um, for the modeling work with MATLAB, it was kind of worked in to a lot of my chemical engineering curriculum in like the first two years of undergrad and then the second two years of undergrad in my BME courses. It's more things that are 
things that look like this instead of like everything you can do with MATLAB because MATLAB is more of like a chemical engineering coding language. And then BME in my later years in college, like applied it to um, like different projects. We, we modeled like, um, I didn't, like if you guys heard of flattening the curve for COVID, we, we modeled that curve based off of like equations. So it's uh, really worked into like chemical engineering and biomedical engineering curriculum. Um, I feel like each major has like a specific coding language that's like, you know, good for their purposes, like MATLAB's really for chemical engineering type stuff. Yeah, very cool. Uh, it looks like we've got a question in the chat. So you use this, this programming environment, MATLAB, uh, to see kind of the best routes that you could take with these changes in the media so that you're not doing all of the experiments, right? Mm -hmm. Because with, that would be more of a waste of time, right? Exactly. And like when we get bigger and bigger and bigger bioreactors, like we scale up the process because we want the therapeutics to reach like everyone that they can possibly help. So we have to make a lot of it. Um, like then we can make small changes to improve the process quality as we do like these scale up processes. So. Cool. And so the model would tell you like how much glucose to add if you want a certain behavior or how much lactose to add. Exactly. And like, as we're running the processes, like we'll, we'll see where all the different levels are at. If we want to keep it at a, sp uh, at a specific level, we can design like a control process. We see it's like falling. So we add a little bit more glucose and things like that. Okay. So, so that control process could then also almost be automated through computer programming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Like yeah, like once a certain that like once a certain levels reached, like the computer will know that, and then the computer will figure out exactly what to add. Yeah, do you find the um, art background you have is helpful in research because of all of these figures and and diagrams you have to make? For sure, like whenever like I'm like writing a scientific paper, um, I think like you have to get pretty creative with how you're displaying your results so that like the most people can understand them. So it's definitely helpful for that. And it's also helpful for like, like the design of experiments. Like if I have all of these different, like if I want to test glutamine, maybe I want to test like a few constellation inhibitor, all these different chemicals that I can add. Like, I feel like my creative background is really helpful in like designing what kind of experiments going to be good to test those different things. Awesome. So what diseases could this research treat in the future? So it can, the therapeutic medicine can treat a lot of diseases that our body can't bite, like um, cancers, also like arthritis and like certain kinds of chronic diseases, which can like last the rest of your life. Um, like it'll target things that the immune system usually can't target because we've specially engineered them to target those things. So awesome. there's like many applications. Well, this is all so fascinating. Uh, I'm gonna hand it back over to Kristen now. And I think we're headed to the activity. Great. Thanks, Vicki. <laughs> Thanks, Lenny, for sharing more of your research with us. Um, so we're going to move on and we're going to talk a couple minutes about our upcoming activity. Uh, so you are going to need a couple of different things for today's activities. Um, you will need to have the antibody activity sheet, uh, a pencil or a pen, scissors, and um, so optional, you can have tape, um, a hole punch, pipe cleaners, and uh, you can even have, you know, markers as well if you would like to color <laughs> your antibodies and antigens and immune cells today. So as you are working through these activities, um, you will be broken out into your breakout rooms and please feel free to turn on your cameras, um, chat, interact 
this activity today is really much more fun <laughs> and interactive if you are able to do that. So not right now, but once you get into your smaller breakout rooms, if you wanna turn your um, cameras and mics on, we are going to be using the, um, the whiteboard um, feature as well. So, <laughs> and your mentors in each of your rooms will be helping to facilitate that. So Maddie, did you have anything else to add right now? Um, I don't think so. I think okay. you've covered it all. Okay. So let's check out the next slide before we go into our five minute break. So we are sort of going to play a guessing game. It's an antibody guessing game. So we'll have our Y-shaped antibodies that everyone will have in our group. And we'll have our antigen. Now there's only gonna be one antigen per group and each person in the group, um, in the breakout room will get a chance to be the antigen. So antigens will need to think of shape. And for example, if I'm an antigen, I'll just say I'm going to be a triangle, okay? So if you all are the antibodies, you are going to be drawing my, um, a shape that would be complementary to me as an antigen. And you can sort of think about this as if um, we'll use a glove <laughs> example. So if I'm an antigen and I um, am hand shaped, then the antibody should be glove shaped so that my hand can fit inside of the glove. So if we're gonna keep our shapes <laughs> more simple than that though. Um, so going back to a triangle shape, um, you know, all my antibody friends are going to be trying to discover what shape I am as the, uh, the antigen. So someone might say, um, they'll have like a U shaped or like an arc. And I'll say, mm, the lines need to be more straight. Or if someone has uh, like a half hexagon shape, I might say it needs fewer sides to really fit together. And in the end, since I am a triangle shape, I would be looking for an antibody that is V-shaped. And you guys will all get a chance to really test this out. And then there is another portion as well that involves some cutting and paying attention to chemical signals and um, different placement of <laughs> our antigens on these, these antibodies that we have available for us. Maddie, did you have anything to add? No, I think, I think that's everything. Okay. Does anybody I guess maybe like, like also, um, if we can't guess the exact like glove shape or V shape or whatever would fit, the antigen, um, the winner will just be whoever's closest. Like what antibody does it look like the antigen will most fit in? Um, so it'll be more of like a subjective kind of winner. Okay. And for this note um, at the bottom here, it says, think about your placement of the pipe cleaners on your antibody cutouts. So in lieu of pipe cleaners, you can also use tape, just scotch tape works or any tape that you have laying around. Okay, so Maddie, if you want to advance to our five minute break slide, please. Thank you. 
Okay, so I have on my clock right now 11.22 a.m. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop our recording. If you would like to take five minutes to get your activity sheet, a pen and paper, um, you know, get anything that you might need to do this activity, feel free to take a bio break and we will see you back here at 11.27. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks again for coming back to us after your breakout room sessions. So unfortunately, I know that we did have some technical difficulties today, and I believe that was largely due to a Zoom update that was just released. So um, we might not have been able to do our antibody guessing game, but for, for those of us that did, um, how did it go? Feel free to share any thoughts in our chat, or if you would like to use the reactions to raise your hand and make a comment, go ahead and do that as well. Manny, if you want to advance the next slide, please. Thank you. So we have some responses coming up in our chat now. Students said it was good and it was fun to guess. Did you find it to be challenging at all to try to figure out what your antigen might have been shaped like? And I know as we were sort of going through and creating this activity, it was neat to be able to see all of the different shapes that we were able to come up with. We had another part of our activity as well. Um, so that was the build an antibody activity. Feel free to share any of your results or if you have any questions, you can add them to our chat. Raise your hand if you'd like to speak out. Okay, so we have one, a couple of final polls, I guess. And these ones are chat responses as well. So we'd like to ask um, how long on average, if you were able to do the antibody um, guessing game experiment, how long on average did it take to guess the antibody shape? And how do you think that this compares to the body? If you have a time guess as to how long it takes the body, Let's put that in the chat. So it took a little bit of um, time for some of the more unique shapes. Maddie, do you have an answer for how this compares to the body? Yeah, so our body is constantly making antibodies and it makes them actually pretty quickly, like you can get like a couple million um, antibodies, you know, 
within a couple of days, like by growing up cells. Um, but as far as like finding the right one, that could take like any amount of time. So, um, um, so yeah, like compared to this activity, it could be close to the same amount of time, maybe, you know, a couple of days difference. It really just depends. And we have another question to another poll question. How did adding sugars to the antibodies affect the attachment? So this is when you added either pipe cleaners or tape to stabilize that attachment, correct? Was that the, um, the sugars were the tape in the, uh, the second activity, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so like having the right material, like a pipe cleaner or tape or having the right sugars um, will increase the binding. So it'll make the attachment more secure generally. And remind us again, why, why do we want that? Why is that a good thing? If the, if the antibody can attach more effectively to both the immune cells and its target, then the, then the therapeutic is a better medicine because it will, you know, more efficiently trigger the right immune response. Thanks. And so we have one last poll here. Why is it important for antibodies to have a good fit to what they are connected to? So I think that sort of referring back to our glove and hand reference, right? So we don't wanna have a glove that doesn't fit or else we wouldn't be able to wear it. It would fall off our hand um, or it would just be too small, wouldn't be shaped correctly. That sort of thing. Is that correct, Maddie? Yeah, so it's kind of like a twofold answer. It like kind of ties into the last one. You want it to attach right so that it's like properly flagging um, the immune system to attack, but also you want it to be pretty specific. So it's attacking that one specific thing rather than a bunch of, you know, off target things. Mm. All right. So if Maddie, if you want to advance to the next slide, um, I just wanted to um, remind everyone that we do have our survey available on Canvas. So if you can please take a minute or two to complete that, we wanna know how we did today. And finally, on our last slide here, I'd like to say um, thank you for joining us. Thank you to Maddie for presenting your research today. Thanks to our middle school friends who were able to join us this morning, to our mentors and to our Road to Research coordination team. We hope to see you for our last session that's gonna be coming up here. I believe it is uh, April 21st. So it's gonna be an after school one. So we hope to see you then. Does anybody have any final questions or comments before I close our session out today? All right. Well, thank you and enjoy the rest of your weekend. And I hope to see you soon.